Hello, my name is Peter, and in this video, I will be talking about indoor air. We've all had the experience of sitting inside all day and wanting to go outside for some fresh air. Taking time to stop your work every now and then and go outside for a walk without distractions is good for you. But aside from benefits to your mental health, what is the difference really between being outdoors and being inside? There are many reasons, ranging from the physical exercise to perhaps the vitamin D you get from the sun. But what about the fresh air itself? Can there really be that much of a difference between your front porch and your living room mere feet away? This is a carbon monoxide monitor. 38 states require you to have these installed in your home, including mine. Carbon dioxide, however, is much less discussed, equally present as carbon monoxide, and yet it does not have any detector requirements in any of the 50 states. Where does CO2 come from, and what does it do? You've probably heard CO2 discussed surrounding issues like global warming, the ozone, and things like that, but I want to discuss how CO2 is affecting your day-to-day -day life, and how buildings are less healthy for you to live in when CO2 is high. First, we need to understand how we measure CO2, parts per million. The normal outdoor air level of CO2 is about 250 to 400 parts per million. At these levels, you should not feel any effects. Then, 400 to 1,000 parts per million is typical of occupied spaces with good airflow. 1,000 to 2,000 parts per million is associated with drowsiness and poor air. 2 to 5,000 parts per million is associated with headaches, sleepiness, and stagnant, stale, stuffy air. Poor concentration, loss of attention, increased heart rate, and slight nausea may also be present. Greater than 5,000 parts per million is where it can start to cause oxygen deprivation, but it's not anywhere near fatal at this point. These are more unusual air conditions. Greater than 40,000 parts per million is immediately harmful due to oxygen deprivation. Now that's a lot of numbers, but the important thing to note is that the effects of CO2 start appearing pretty rapidly, but it takes a lot more for it to become lethal. You'll also notice that these amounts were linked with airflow in rooms. This is important because outside, the parts per million fluctuates very slowly and is much lower in general. In a 2002 study, researchers measured CO2 levels in office buildings and linked them to different levels of airflow. They said that the results suggest that increases in the ventilation rates per person among typical office buildings will, on average, significantly reduce the prevalence of several sick building syndrome symptoms. Sick building syndrome includes the symptoms mentioned earlier, like loss of attention, headaches, etc. This simply means that having proper airflow indoors is one of the quickest and most efficient ways to reduce indoor CO2. A 2014 study showed that students at schools performed academic tasks consistently worse as CO2 levels increased when compared with control groups. Again, CO2 can make you have trouble focusing, and you might just attribute it to stress or being tired without knowing. Now let's take a trip over to the University of New Hampshire. Here at the University of New Hampshire, if you're a student, you don't always have the opportunity to go outside all the time. Classrooms are often very small and packed with students, and this is an environment where CO2 levels rise quite rapidly. In a normal-sized living room, it only takes 45 minutes for CO2 to rise from 500 parts per million to 1,000. So imagine what a room like this can get to over the course of one hour lecture full of 100 students. If you're watching this video, it is likely that you are a UNH student. So what is UNH doing for you in this situation? Well, here is a graph of UNH CO2 emissions from 1990 to 2014. In late 2004, UNH started to take action to reduce CO2 around the campus. There are many ways that this is achieved, but one way that is directly related to indoor air is some of UNH's energy efficient projects. Here's a table of different projects in different halls around UNH. 
On the left, you can see the name of the undertaking, followed by how much money and CO2 it saved. For example, Hamsmith's heating system was updated, which resulted in $16,000 saved over the course of a year, as well as 600,000 pounds of CO2 avoided. Furthermore, UNH students are biking more and more. In 2001, a large majority, 93%, of students listed driving as their primary commute mode. A mere three years later, biking or walking rose to 45%. You'll also notice that New Hampshire Transit rose as well. This is obviously preferable to people each driving separate cars. So what's the point of all this? Well, unfortunately, there's not much you can immediately do for the air all around you. But you can help yourself and those around you by just opening a window or maybe trying to have class outside. Maybe CO2 isn't something you ever really thought about. But I hope that watching this video informed you. So next time you have a headache or are just feeling tired in general and you can't concentrate, take a walk or even just open a window. Having a few potted plants in your dorm can also be a steady way to reduce CO2. Whatever you decide to do, a little fresh air never hurt anybody. Thanks for listening.